Hagland exostosis and insertional tendinopathy. Many thanks to the author, Thurman Hayo. This video was created based on findings from the book cited below. Thurman, H. 2017. New Techniques in Foot and Ankle Surgery. Springer International Publishing. Hagland's deformity was first described by Patrick Hagland in 1927. It is also known as retrocalcaneal exostosis, Mulholland deformity, and pump bump. It is a quite common clinical condition, but still poorly understood. An enlargement of the bony section of the heel, where the Achilles tendon is inserted, triggers this condition. The soft tissue near the back of the heel can become irritated when the large, bony lump rubs against rigid shoes. The etiology is not well known, but some probable causes like a tight Achilles tendon, a high arch of the foot, and heredity have been suggested as causes. Middle age is the most common age of affection, females are more affected than males, and the occurrence is often bilateral. Many thanks to the author, Vaishu et al. This video was created based on findings from the article cited below. Vaishya R. Agawalak, Aziziat, VJV Hagland's Syndrome, a commonly seen mysterious condition. Curious. 2016 October 7th semicolon 810, E820. It is characterized by pain in the back of the heel, which is more after rest. Clinical evaluation and lateral radiographs of the ankle are mostly enough to make a diagnosis of Hagland's syndrome. The pain could be due to associated Achilles tendonitis and retrocalcaneal bursitis. This condition can mimic other causes of hind foot pain like isolated retrocalcaneal bursitis, plantar fasciitis, and seronegative spondyloarthropathies. Hagland's syndrome is often treated conservatively by altering the heel height in shoe wear, orthosis, physiotherapy, anti-inflammatory drugs, and local steroid injection. Surgical excision of the bony exostosis of the calcaneum is only required in resistant cases. Hagland's deformity is an abnormality of the posterior superior part of the calcaneus, where there is a bony enlargement at the attachment of the Achilles tendon. The adjoining soft tissues can get irritated when this bony lump rubs against rigid shoes. It often leads to retrocalcaneal bursitis, calcaneal tendon bursitis, and thickening and inflammation of the calcaneal tendon. This combination of pathology is known as Hagland's syndrome. Inflammation of the different parts of soft tissue in the area can lead to an isolated condition, however, the treatment options are different in these conditions, and so they should be differentiated. It is mostly an idiopathic condition, but several contributory factors like overpractice in runners, tight or poorly fitting shoes, or altered biomechanics of foot joints because of the de-aligned subtalar joint may play a role. Pain at the posterior heel is the presenting feature. It may be associated with limping and swelling. The pain is prominent while the patient begins to walk after rest. This condition may be unilateral or bilateral. History of any rheumatologic conditions like gout, rheumatoid arthritis, or seronegative spondyloarthropathies should be considered. In a lateral radiograph, a bony prominence, Hagland's lesion, at the posterior superior part of the calcaneal tuberosity, calcaneal bursal swelling, and increased density in pre-Achilles bursi, figure, are apparent in these patients. These findings may be associated with a calcaneal spur and heterotopic bone formation at the insertion of the Achilles tendon and within the Achilles tendon. The diagnosis of Hagland's syndrome is often based on history and clinical findings, radiographic changes may add a further clue to its diagnosis. There are no clear-cut radiological criteria for diagnosing Hagland's lesion, especially in the initial stages. However, some angles on plane radiographs have been described. A magnetic resonance imaging MRI, scan is done in questionable cases. It shows posterior superior calcaneal spurring with impingement on the Achilles tendon. There may be associated synovial thickening and collection in the retrocalcaneal bursa with thickening and high signal in the insertional fibers of Achilles tendon and edema in the adjoining retroachilles fat pad figure. 
All these findings are consistent with Achilles tendinosis with retrocalcaneal and retroachilles bursitis. MRI image of ankle and foot showing posterior superior bony spurring of calcaneus, retrocalcaneal bursitis, and impingement of Achilles tendon. Conservative measures include a reassessment of the shoe of the patient and heel pads or heel lifts in the cases of high arched feet. Casting may be necessary for pain reduction and an ice bag may be necessary to deal with swelling. Anti-inflammatory drugs, oral or topical, stretching exercises, and physiotherapy may relieve tension from the calcaneal tendon. Local perilesional steroid injections are also used in refractory cases. If conservative treatment is not effective, then surgical treatment options like retrocalcaneal decompression and calcaneal ostectomy or osteotomy are used. Inadequate bone resection can lead to the recurrence of symptoms. The surgical technique is as follows. After administration of general or regional anesthesia, a longitudinal lateral incision 1 cm lateral to the Achilles tendon is made, extending distally from 3 to 4 cm proximal to the superior tuberosity of the calcaneus to 2 to 3 cm distal to the superior tuberosity of the calcaneus. The ankle joint is plantar flexed, and by sharp and blunt dissection, the Achilles tendon is identified. A right-angled retractor is placed between the Achilles tendon and the posterior and superior borders of the calcaneal tuberosity. The retrocalcaneal bursa is exposed as well as the superior border of the calcaneal tuberosity without raising any of the Achilles tendon of the calcaneus figure. However, the Achilles tendon has such an extensive insertion into the posterior and plantar aspect of the calcaneal tuberosity that raising a 1 to 2 cm long portion of the tendon may be necessary to resect the bone adequately. The retrocalcaneal bursa is removed first then the superior aspect of the tuberosity is removed with an osteotome. The placement of several drill holes along the proposed osteotomy site makes this resection easier. If intratendineal calcification is present, it should be removed. A well padded, short leg, the non weight bearing cast is applied, with the ankle in approximately 20 degrees of plantar flexion. The cast and sutures are removed at two weeks, but the non weight bearing cast remains on for three weeks. Then a removable weight bearing cast boot is applied, and active plantar flexion and dorsiflexion exercises are begun. It is important in the preoperative counseling to explain to a young woman with a pump bump that it might be three to six months before she can wear a stylish shoe and that there is no guarantee that she will ever be able to do so comfortably. The reported surgical complications include Achilles tendon avulsion, persistent posterior heel pain, wound breakdown, nerve injuries, medial calcaneal sensory nerve and sural nerve, ankle stiffness, and incisional neuroma. Haglund's syndrome is a common cause of hind foot pain in adults, but it is still a poorly understood clinical condition. Conservative management is often effective in most cases, and surgery is required only in resistant cases. Haglund exostosis and insertional tendinopathy. Indications to resection. Resection of the prominence of the calcaneal tuberosity with insertional tendinopathy of the Achilles tendon and often with bursitis is indicated after at least six months of physical therapy exercises, flexor muscle chain stretching, and, possibly, autologous conditioned plasma, ACP, injections and shockwave therapy. Contraindications for severe circulatory disorders or relative contraindications such as cardiac disease or severe diabetes, the interval for conservative treatment should be lengthened and surgery should not be pursued aggressively. Surgical setup. A normal arthroscopy set, 4 mm, is used for arthroscopic procedures at the Achilles tendon as well as a straight osteotome, a power asp for smoothing the distal aspect of the resected surface facing the tendon, and a 5.0 shaver for debridement. The Haglund exostosis is removed through a minimally invasive portal. Debridement is performed and the resection site is smoothed with a power asp up to the distal insertion site. Provisional skin closure is then performed followed by additional endoscopic debridement of the Achilles tendon up to the mid portion. At the anterior aspect of the tendon, debridement is carried to the inferior portion of the soleus muscle. Lateral portal for access to cages triangle and the Achilles tendon. 
The Hagland exostosis is marked with a number one needle. The Hagland exostosis is visualized using a small Hohmann and a Langenbeck retractor. The exostosis is removed with a hashtag 10 osteotome up to the distal insertion of the Achilles tendon. The resection site is smoothed with a rasp or a power rasp, particularly at the medial aspect. After the bone resection is complete, the medial side is carefully inspected through the lateral portal to look for residual bone. Denervation is performed with ball electrocautery at the lateral and medial periosteum of the calcaneus. During this mini open portion of the procedure, the Achilles tendon is palpated for firm scar tissue. If present, the tissue is removed with a number 11 scalpel until soft tissue structures are encountered. To facilitate this, the tendon is held in aversion with a small three pronged rake. The wound is then closed at the center of the 2 cm incision with external sutures. The arthrisks then inserted up to the medial side. A second portal is created here with a number 11 scalpel. The junctional areas of the Achilles tendon are extensively debrided once again arthroscopically down to the insertion site. The camera is focused on the tendon from the posterior and the entire Achilles tendon is smoothed again throughout the debrided area. As anterior adhesions are often present at the site of the mid-portion tendinopathy, additional debridement of the anterior vessels, in growth tissue, and anterior periosteum is performed through the medial and lateral portals over a length of 4 to 5 cm or even 6 cm. The distal tendon insertion is again thoroughly debrided with various instruments. A collagen sponge is placed at the site of the calcaneus osteotomy in resection to achieve rapid hemostasis. Any bleeding is coagulated with the electrocautery. The facial and subcutaneous layers are sutured. A red on drain, 8 mm, is inserted laterally along the Achilles tendon to avoid injury to the sural nerve. After layered wound closure, growth factors, ACP, are injected into the debrided area and into the osteotomy site to achieve rapid hemostasis. Early hemostasis using a collagen sponge and growth factors around the calcaneal insertion will help to avoid long-term edema formation at the resection site. For Hagland exostosis and insertional tendinopathy, the pain radiates into the bones, and mechanical obstruction is caused by the calcaneus. This prominence is removed with an osteotome through a minimally invasive incision, 2 cm, to obtain optimal resection of the bone. This can also be performed endoscopically, but this takes more time and leads to subsequent ossification. Because of this, the endoscopic only technique no longer seems advisable. After resection of the bone, the subsequent procedure is performed endoscopically. Areas of tendon degeneration can be removed in optimal fashion using the magnification provided by the arthroscope. Mid-portion tendinopathy is often present as well, in which case anterior debridement of the Achilles tendon is performed, neovascularization and nerve in growth tissue, as well as debridement of the peritonin. Aftercare. Partial weight bearing for 14 days, range of motion exercises, and a physical therapy program. After 14 days, weight bearing is advanced to full and athletic activities can gradually be advanced with cycling and water jogging. Growth factors, ACP, are also injected into the area three times to accelerate the healing and remodeling processes of the tendon. Thanks for watching my video. Do not forget to subscribe to my non-profit channel.